Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the intelligent social media platform. You can visit us at noetic.app or download the Noetic app to your iPhone and Android devices to get top notch lectures, recitations, audiobooks on the humanities and meet people who are like minded. I'm back with Dr. Jonathan Cook, and today we're going to be discussing Robert Louis Stevenson's The Ebb Tide, and I believe this was born out of our last conversation on Herman Melville's Omu. Um, Dr. Cook, welcome back. What, yeah. made you, what made you choose to talk about The Ebb Tide? I've, I, this is my first encounter with the text. I believe that you have a little bit more familiarity with it. Actually, a lot more. Yeah. Uh, so I, um, I was just teaching it this spring uh, because I was doing a course in, that I was calling the, the Literature of High Adventure. And um, um, I wanted to do some, some new authors, some new work that I hadn't done before. And so I paired Stevenson up with uh, Ryder Haggard's King Solomon's Mine, and um, uh, Joseph Conrad, some of his shorter fiction, because they're all, you know, late 19th century, um, sort of uh, authors who were dealing with British imperialism. And uh, uh, so uh, we did Stevenson last, um, not necessarily because what we were reading was chronologically the last last piece of writing, but uh, we, I wanted to do Stevenson's South Sea Tales um, because um, um, partly because of my interest in Melville, I wanted to see what he had to say about um, uh, Pacific cultures and the interface of um, imperialist uh, projects of England and France and Germany. In the Pacific, of course, Melville was writing uh, from uh, his vid based on his visit in the 1840s. Stevenson went to the Pacific in the late 1880s, and he lived there. Back, in fact, he you know he died in Samoa in uh, 1894. Um, so uh, you know, and he spent, I think, what about the last four years of his life in, in the Pacific. I mean, he took a cruise there from San Francisco. He rented a, a big old uh, b a sailboat to tour. And then, because originally he was just traveling, um, I think he was going to go back to England where he, he had been living in uh, southern England. But he eventually just decided to stay in in Pacific, partly because of health. You know, he his most of his adult life he was in fairly precarious health and um his wife of course was from california so um you know she had family or connections with san francisco and so stevenson um you know lived in samoa he's first of all he toured the pacific and then he settled in samoa and built a big house and he was he used that as kind of a base of operation for observing uh, what was going on in the Pacific. He chose Samoa because it was the least impacted by or a less lesser impact of European powers than, say, Tahiti or Hawaii. Um, there was kind of a joint agreement for Samoa between Germany and England and uh, I think the U.S. and France. Um, so there was more uh, sovereign power given to the local chiefs, which, of course, Stevenson um, supported. You know, he was a big supporter of the native cultures of the Pacific against the invasive practices of, of Europeans, um, which, of course, is very similar to Melville. Um, so, uh, you know, it kind of made me think more about Stevenson and, and, and all of his work that not many people read. I mean, academically, he's being rediscovered, say, in the last 25 years um, after being kind of excluded from the official canon of English literature. But now 
a lot of people are interested in him because of uh, various f trends in his work, um, the Gothic tradition and the um, anti-imperialism of some of his writing. So, uh, Ebb Tide is a great is a great story. It's not too long. It's like a hundred and thirty pages or so. It's a novella, and um, it's a really good representative of his writings from his Pacific period. Um, so that's that's one reason to, or many several reasons to read it. Well, yeah, and I think maybe we can, if we can just uh, expand another point that you uh, reference in passing, um, not only, uh, I, I guess the, the question that I have is, what are the areas of intersection and dissimilarity between Melville and Stevenson. I, I imagine many individuals who are listening to this conversation right now are familiar with all the work that we've done on Melville. So I think they might be interested in, in hearing you elaborate upon those distinctions or similarities just a little bit more. I mean, it should be obvious if you go back and you listen to our talk on Omu, but if, if we could boil it down to maybe two or three key aspects? Well, there's half a century difference between the worlds they're, they're observing. So, um, I mean, Taipei, uh, the, the Melville person, persona, Tomo, is, is living with a tribe of cannibals. Of course, when Stevenson was in the Pacific, of course, cannibalism was kind of a, a past history and old, you know, grandfather looking guys were paraded around as being the last guy who ate a human being. Uh, they were kind of a tourist uh, attraction to see who, who the last cannibal was on in certain places. Um, so the world of um, Omu is a little more like Stevenson in that uh, there's sort of a, a bunch of Europeans uh, living off the fat of the land uh, in uh, Omu. You know, they're kind of like beachcombers, which is a term that shows up in Melville. Um, and uh, a lot of them are up to no good um, and kind of interfering with native cultures, preying on the native women, um, European cultures trying to assume uh, imperial authority over these islands. So Omu, you know, the world of Omu is, is very similar to what's going on in terms of um, uh, relationships between Europeans and native peoples in, uh, in Stevenson. I mean, that, that, that carries over. I mean, things are a little more advanced. More Polynesians have died because of um, European diseases, smallpox, syphilis, um, there's greater control by, you know, the, like the rest of the world, uh, the Pacific had been divided up by the imperial powers of England and France and Germany and, and to the United States to a certain extent. Um, so, um, but, you know, Melville is, is one of a number of Pacific writers of the 19th century. I mean, there were, there were others who were working in this tradition of... Ch Charles Warren Stoddard right, South, wrote South Sea Idols about his visit to uh, the Pacific in 18, uh, I think, 64, 65. Pierre Lotti, a uh, French writer, also writing about Tahiti. Uh, so there's a whole tradition of, of uh, individuals writing about sort of the negative impact of European cultures on these these Edenic uh, Polynesian peoples whose cultures were really just shredded by um, the impact of Europeans. I mean, they, the first people arriving, of course, were usually missionaries, but then behind the missionaries came the traders, um, the whale uh, uh, boats that came with uh, uh, people, you know, like the, who, uh, you know, that Melville uh, was part of. And um, so the integration of the Pacific economy to Europe was more and more um, developed at this point. And 
the native people, you know, they lost their, they, they, they were no longer able to um, be partially naked. They had to be clothed. They had to, of course, follow new mandates from if they were going to be part of this Christian society. Um, they were part of a trading network, buying European goods. So uh, their, their native cultures were gradually being um, uh, eliminated by, by this pressure. And, so you would uh, say that the primary distinction is a temporal one, and we get to see a little bit more of the post-lapsarian yeah. view of these of Edenic yeah. people through Stevenson. But yeah. there really isn't that much daylight between Melville and Stevenson in, in regards to Omu and the Ebb Tide. Yeah, I think both of them are looking out for the native people. I mean, they right. really support the native cultures. They don't like what's happening. It's not that they're totally against the missionaries, because in some cases the missionaries are bringing education. Um, they're bringing some more enlightened views on, on maybe the treatment of women. But... Um, on the whole, they are pretty fiercely critical of lots of negative features of the of the colonial uh, domination of the culture. Now, are are the reasons besides the ones that we've already enumerated for reading Stevenson? Um, Stevenson, I believe, I guess, entered my consciousness uh, when I was younger I, through Treasure Island, and we were talking about that a little bit uh, before. The, sh the show began. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of people out there who would associate Stevenson with um, a, a, a juvenile reading list. Yeah. Are there other, how would we persuade them other than what we've already said that he's worth taking seriously now? Well, first of all, you can enjoy Treasure Island and Kidnapped as, as adults, but you know, f for the good storytelling, Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, uh, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that all the sort of pirate culture of modern popular culture, a lot of it goes back to Stevenson. Long John Silver was his invention, this character, is one the wooden-legged character. Um, so there's a lot more. I mean, the, I think the movies and television and comic books have... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, sort of made the story into something we assume is kind of kitsch. But uh, Stevenson is a really good storyteller, and he's he's very good with adventure stories. I mean, he's he's really an heir to Sir Walter Scott in terms of telling a good yarn. Um, and of course, he was um, born in the same area and uh, grew up reading Scott. Um, so, I mean, just like I mean, you can say Hawthorne wrote a lot of children's literature, right? He wrote collections of uh, <clears throat> stories for children, retelling mythological stories, but we that we don't um, criticize him as being not serious uh, because he did that. You know, he was just trying to make money, which is what I think <clears throat> Stevenson definitely was trying to make money. He... Uh, <clears throat> He had a lot of expenses because, I mean, he came from a wealthy family. His his family um, business was lighthouse construction. His uh, his father was part of a family, uh, an engineering firm that constructed a lot of the lighthouses around the coast of Scotland. And uh, Stevenson's father was an engineer. Stevenson actually was supposed to inherit the business, and he trained for a little while as an engineer, but he was... He, he was just not at all interested. And then, uh, you know, he went on to try to become a lawyer. So he he actually became uh, qualified to practice law, but never did because by the, his mid-20s, he realized he, he needed to write. And uh, But at that point, of course, his health became a major issue uh, because he had some kind of lung ailment. I mean, people... Um, today aren't really sure what was wrong with him, but um, he, of course, thought he had tuberculosis. Um, but it's a lot of the symptoms he had are uh, for other kinds of lung illness, like sarcoidosis, I think, is one of them. 
uh, there are two or three other kinds of lung conditions that he probably um, inherited from his family because some of his mother's family had similar health problems. But he was just amazingly thin. I mean, he was just, <clears throat> you know, he was, I think, about 5 foot 10, but he, at one point he weighed about 110 pounds. Um, Whoa. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, he looked, you know, sometimes he looked like an Auschwitz survivor. Uh, so he spent a lot of time trying to find the right place to live for his health. He went to Davos, Switzerland to be treated for TB um, because that's what they thought it was. And uh, and uh, he did a lot of traveling uh, in warmer climates um, to try to recuperate his health because he, he just could not live in Scotland because of the damp and chilly weather. Um, so after his mid-twenties, he pretty much left Scotland except for visits that, you know, could could prolong themselves. <clears throat> so you said that he wrote the novella in America Samoa, is that right? Yeah, he was living in <clears throat> he was living in Samoa. It wasn't it wasn't divided up at that point. Okay. Um published in eighteen ninety four um written in eighteen ninety three. He died in December eighteen ninety four. <clears throat> and uh you know he left a lot of unfinished work at his death. And at that point in Samoa, he was supporting a huge extended family. I mean, he was supporting his his wife, his uh, wife's son, you know, stepson, his wife's daughter, uh, a bunch of servants. Um, his mother was living with him there as well. So he had huge expenses. I mean, he had inherited money from his family, but he needed to make money to um to support all of these people who had just kind of latched onto him. I mean, it, it's a kind of a sad story about his wife's family, you know, Fanny Osborne. Um he met her in France and she was married to an American whom she had left. She lived in San Francisco and this guy was serially unfaithful to her and she finally got fed up and moved to France with her daughter and um you know, she was uh, in her late 30s when she met Stevenson. There was 11 years difference in their ages. They got married. He was 29. She was 40. And she had a son named Lloyd who ended up um, uh, working with Stevenson because he wanted to be a writer. And Stevenson really supported him and really um, helped him out over and over again. And Lloyd was a very mediocre talent. And he actually contributed a tiny bit to the ebb tide. Yeah, yeah. How did we not talk about that so far? That was like the thing that immediately jumped out to me. Yeah, is that this is a collaborative oh, right. work yeah. in a, in a sense. And uh, uh, it so maybe you can talk about it's the 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 ratio of work that I don't think uh, we know exactly. I mean, Lloyd Stevenson wrote started writing a story called The Pearl Fisher, <clears throat> and of course Atwater the crazy um, uh, English autocrat who who's, shows up in the third, two thirds of the way through the story is a pearl fisher. So I don't, think we, I don't think we know exactly how much Lloyd contributed, but probably not that much. I mean, this was really um, his stepfather's story. I don't, I don't think we need to worry about giving credit to Lloyd. I mean, Lloyd Stevenson, he tried to exploit his <clears throat> his stepfather's reputation for for his whole life, and he published a bunch of really mediocre fiction. And he was kind of like a a vampire on the estate. Um, so uh, I don't know. His name is mentioned just because Stevenson insisted on putting it there, but we really don't have to worry that this is a full collaboration because it isn't. Was that was that uncommon at the time? I mean, I I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. Not that I have complete mastery of of all of literature ever, but it's a pretty rare thing for there to be a pretty duo. unusual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's uh, anything not else that come common? to mind? Well, Conrad Joseph Conrad collaborated with Four Maddox Ford on a historical novel that was kind of mediocre. And that took forever to write. So I think it doesn't really work most of the time. It's, uh, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, it's almost like two people sewn together. It's like a, it's like a, 
it's, it's like, like a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a weird Mingala experiment. It's you know? a three legged race, you know, <laughs> yeah. so you don't, you don't go as fast as if your legs weren't tied together, you know, you, you go faster. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I just, I pulled up Wikipedia here while we were talking there. There's some wonder, not only is there, are there, are there some great photographs of Stevenson? Yeah. Um, but there's some John Singer Sargent did some awesome yeah, he, he did two, portraits of him. Two portraits of him, yeah, because uh, Stevenson lived in southern England for a while in the mid-1880s. He was in a town called Bournemouth, and uh, he was there for four years. They bought a house, and uh, John Singer Sargent came by to paint him. He also was visited a lot by Henry James, because Henry James's sister Alice was there. She was a convalescent. So he got to know James, who really admired him and thought he was very charismatic. And he also got to be good friends with uh, Percy Shelley's only living child, mm. uh, Percy uh, Shelley and his wife. Um, and they um, got to talk about, you know, Shelley as a romantic. And Steve, everyone was saying, oh, yeah, that was, you know, Stevenson learned a lot from Shelley, and uh, he was really a romantic writer uh, because he he used the supernatural and the and the imaginary more than you know strict realists or naturalists would in some of his fiction. So yeah, he had a he had a pretty active uh, cultural life when he lived in southern England, and uh, Sargent painted him like he painted Henry James. He painted a lot of people in the in the late 19th century and actually Sargent's patron a guy named Fairchild who was an American industrialist um took a shine to Stevenson and actually uh funded Stevenson's uh, move back to the US in um 18 I think 88 because he spent a winter on Saranac Lake at a uh, a new tuberculosis um, spa up in the Adirondacks, run by a guy who was an American guy who was doing a lot of <clears throat> innovative work on TB. And this guy Fairchild said, "Hey, you got to come over and you know uh, check out this clinic." So the Stevensons moved, and they they rented a house. And of course, in the middle of the winter, it was like thirty below, and they had very little heat. I mean, they were really roughing it in this uh, in this winter there. And it was at, while they were there, they, to recover from this, they had they took this cruise around the Pacific because they were so tired of this you know this freezing winter, uh, which they had in the Adirondacks. So, um, so that was Fairchild, who was was a supporter of of Stevenson. Uh, also, they, there was some correspondence between them. Um, so, uh, speaking of high society people, I, I, I noticed his full name is Robert Louis Balfour. Balfour Stevenson. Stevenson yeah. Is, is there any connection there to Lord Balfour? Well, I don't know. In Scotland, uh, there are all kinds of shared names. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Just curious where, if you know off the top of your head. Yeah. Balfour. Uh, I'm not sure where the name comes in. He had lots of Scottish relatives, <clears throat> many of whom were very talented professionals. Uh, lawyers and engineers, um, and uh, he he um, benefited from staying, visiting them, and learning, getting stories from his relatives, learning about the history of Scotland. Uh, so he was really a a wellspring of Scottish history. He did a lot of research. In fact, he wanted, he was going to write a book on Scottish history when he was in his mid twenties, um, and a lot of his fiction as well, or some of his fiction. Uh, is involved with uh, things like the Jacobite uprising of 1745 um, in the novel uh, The Master of Ballantrae, which is an adventure novel. That's uh, very gripping. Whoa. So. That's, that sounds enticing. Yeah. So I can't help but wonder, you, you alluded to how this is kind of a documentation of European disease spreading through the Pacific and I guess would properly fall into the category of pandemic literature. Uh, but at the same time, Stevenson himself is suffering from all these sicknesses. And I'm wondering how, uh, how these two things work together in something 
like the ebb tide or in other works the fact that he himself was I, yeah. a, a a sickly individual and also was documenting sickness at ravaging native populations yeah well he um the beginning of the ebb tide of course shows an influenza epidemic and we kind of forget there was a huge influenza epidemic about in europe in about 1890 um that sort of predated the the major epidemic of 1918 um but the big ravager at this time was smallpox um which um i'm not sure when it stopped affecting people but um it certainly plays a role in the story because the the whole motivation for these the three um guys at the beginning of the story to get on that ship the fair alone is because the captain and the and the uh, first mate and a made an, an important crewman all died of smallpox um and smallpox was ravaging certain islands of the pacific i guess um they just said they had no immunity it was just like the arrival of europeans in north america um so people just just like covid you know there was absolutely nothing you could do um except sit it out uh and hope you didn't die so uh and it also affects of course the island where they end up with um um atwater who dominates this beautiful pacific um uh, e paradisical lagoon um you know 30 uh now 29 of his native helpers have died in the smallpox um epidemic that's happened recently so the story is premised on um this massive die out of uh, smallpox victims um which that and syphilis i guess were the major um killers that were brought by europeans i was just looking up an nih article on smallpox in the pacific or whatever apparently it it the, the population that it decimated the most uh in the 19th century uh were the aboriginal peoples of uh, australia australia really yeah yeah but um, I, I don't it's a pr it's a pretty heady research paper, so I don't have time to skim it while I'm talking to you. Yeah. But uh, I think that's well, just an interesting thing if something if people want to per peruse that. I mean, I think it you know well into the 20th century, it was a really a dreaded uh, killer, of particular of, of young people, children. Um, of course, we all you know chicken pox is a is a I guess a relative that we all <clears throat> you know is much milder. So I. I have I have not done my homework on the <laughs> connections between smallpox and chickenpox, but at least etym etymologically, it's there. Yeah. Uh, something I, I wanted to interject for the listeners: uh, what I what I love doing with Doctor Cook is that we oftentimes are innovating in these podcast discussions because so rarely do we have a scholar of such eminence translating their knowledge into a discussion format for people on the internet. Before we got started, we did, uh, both Dr. Cook and I came across a scholar who had given a talk on the ebb tide, uh, Canon Schmidt, um, who gave a wonderful lecture that I endorse and I'll include in the show notes if anybody's interested in it. But other than that, I don't really think there's very much out there. I think we both concluded there were a lot of papers, but not so many talks or, or lectures uh, for you to listen to. Uh, I guess we should get into the breakdown of some of the characters, specifically Herrick, Davis, um, Hush. What, what, Hush, do, we, what yeah. do we, yeah. It, well, these are kind of, uh, uh, three guys on the skids and Herrick, of course, is sort of the Stevenson surrogate. I mean, not that much of a resemblance, except he's the educated one. He's English. He's failed at the family businesses, which is what, Stevenson did. He tried right. to become an engineer. He couldn't do it. He just told his father, no, I'm sorry, I can't. His father was very upset about that. Um, so he's showing someone who ends up on the skids in Tahiti, as as indeed uh, Stevenson m might have ended up if he didn't uh, make a name for himself as a writer. Um, but 
so Herrick is there because he's gone to New York. He's failed there. He's going to San Francisco. He's failed in business there. And then <clears throat> people who want to kind of live off the fat of the land just go to the Pacific and eke out a living, um, you know, trying to get a job or marry a native wife or whatever. So anyway, Herrick is, is the educated one. Davis is the American ship's captain who's on the skids because he's been banned from captaining ships because he's sunk a ship while he was drunk he he had a you know he, he's potentially alcoholic and he killed um a bunch of people when his ship went down so he's on the lamb from um you know this disastrous career as a ship's captain and who is is a lower class cockney from london who is kind of a clerical guy who is um uh, was working, but he's lost his job in Tahiti. I mean, he's he's a lower class character who is sort of one step ahead of being a thief or something, um, and he has a rich Cockney accent uh, as well. So these three guys decide, you know, they're all living on the beach in Tahiti, and they're trying to figure out how are they going to survive because you know every day is a challenge to get a meal. So the beginning of the story, they're lucky in that. A boat comes in and some native crew members are eating breakfast and uh, Davis uh, does a little dance for them to entertain them and then they ask him you know do you want to share some food with us so they give him some you know roasted bananas and stuff so they're um, just one step away from you know starvation uh, and then they are hanging out in the local jail um, and hoping for some kind of breakthrough. And uh, what happens is the Farallone, the ship that has lost its captain and first mate and a crew member because of smallpox, needs a captain to continue uh, the shipment of the cargo to uh, <laughs> Australia, the champagne. Yeah, they got a hold full of champagne, supposedly. And um, <clears throat> so Davis says, you know, I'll take over, and they let no one wants to do it because they're afraid of the smallpox. Maybe it's on board still. Davis accepts the commission, and he tells the two other guys, "Come on, let's let's do this." And of course, as soon as they get on the ship, uh, they uh, figure out uh, they're going to do something different, which is sail <laughs> to uh, they're going to sail to South America, <coughs> sell the champagne sell the ship and then maybe do some silver mining and uh, get rich that way you know to hell with the uh, with the cargo of champagne um, and the, and this leads to one of the <laughs> uh, one of the ironic inversions yeah one of the great discoveries <laughs> uh, when they the uh, of course who <laughs> goes into the hold and breaks open a bottle and says hey let's have some champagne you know why well, might as well enjoy ourselves while we're doing this sure and davis is a little resistant but of course he breaks down and starts drinking and that's the end of him because he just is drinking non-stop at that point and uh that's going to that's going to be a problem because he's got he's the captain he's got to sail the ship so when they're almost blown over um uh, by a squall, um, Herrick, you know, threatens him that he's going to do some terrible deed unless he, you know, gets gets his act together to save them. So Davis sort of pulls himself together and, and realizes that he just he doesn't want to be responsible for a bunch of more people being killed. So he stops drinking. <clears throat> But of course, at that point, they've uh, you know they've eaten a lot of food, and thrown away a lot of food. When they're drunk, they were just you know eating and just tossing stuff aside and whatever. So pretty soon they're out of food. So they realize they can't sail to South America. They're going to have to sail uh, west to maybe find some island where they can provision. Um, and so the new plan, as well is that, uh, you know, they'll just sink the ship for the insurance. Um, but they have to get some food before they starve to death, before they can do that. So anyway, those are the three guys. It's it's kind of reminds you a little bit about some of Con Joseph Conrad's ne'er-do-well characters. 
like an outpost of progress, these two guys who were living on the Congo River and uh, just trying to uh, do their jobs, but they, they end up you know, getting really antsy because the river, the boat has not come up the river to provision them and they get start starving and they get angry at each other and, you know, they end up killing each other. No, one guy shoots the other and then hangs himself because they go crazy. <clears throat> so it's a very Conradian uh, kind of scenario of these two, these two uh, ne'er-do-wells, Europeans who uh, are up to no good. Although only one of them really has a conscience, well, you know, there's a spectrum of sort of um, conscience, very, you know, semi-conscientious, uh, and then the corrupt one, of course, is a Huish, who uh, is just kind of defiant, lower-class guy, who just hates authority generally. I was going to, I, I was going to ask you of another one of the ironic inversions yeah. that you were going to discuss was uh, the... Uh, discovery as to the quality of their cargo. Yeah, yeah, wonderful twist in the storyline. I hate to be a spoiler here. But, oh, oh, okay. Maybe we should. Maybe but, we should. You know, another. Well, we can we can do it anyway. So another okay. twist is the champagne. Uh, turns out it, it's just a bunch of champagne on the top. Below, it's all just bottles of water. So they realize that the guys who were shipping. Um, who were sending, uh, you know, this cargo to Australia had already planned to sink the ship for the insurance money because obviously they didn't have a cargo of champagne. <clears throat> so, you know, it's it's like the parable of the biter's bit. I mean, it's a s perfect scenario of sort of all right. kinds of stories. The guy, the people who are trying to fool other people get fooled themselves. Yeah, it's very, it's very meta. Yeah. <laughs> The perfect uh, storyline. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. And I'm, I'm trying to think where that that motif has been used elsewhere in popular culture. It's not it's not so uncommon that I haven't heard it before. But when it's pulled off, and I think it's pulled off exceptionally well here. That's all. It's always makes for for great entertainment. Yeah. Well, I remember it from uh, the first one of the first examples of uh, Chaucer's The Nun's Priest Tale, where the the story of the uh, the sort of inglorious rooster, Chanticleer, who has a dream about being caught by a fox, you know, and so the fox seduces him uh, by praising his singing, <clears throat> and then he opens his mouth to sing, and the fox grabs him, and runs off with him, and then the fox says, you know, why are you running away so fast? Uh, you know, look at all the people running after us, crying out. Why don't you tell them that you're so smart? And you're, uh, you know, that you've got me in your mouth. So he, the fox opens his mouth mm. and the rooster flies away, you know, and <laughs> realizes that <clears throat> he's gotten back at the fox. Anyway, it's, it's yeah. a great, it's a great uh, plot device that, you know, appears all over the place. And usually in comedy or satire. Right. So, um... So, is the uh, Atwater this true tropical paradise, or is it something else? Yeah, that's. I, I think this guy Atwater is one of the most interesting characters in all of Stevenson and, and a lot of nineteenth-century literature. He's so he's so weird because he's like this righteous Christian who uh, who's a gigantic, you know, six foot four, muscular guy who runs this kind of autocratic regime on the island so you know when they get there uh they think oh my god you know we're saved because here's a guy a white guy european um but of course they realize that he's a pearl um, uh, harvester right he's a, he has this secret island where he's been harvesting pearls with diving suits for 10 years and he's got this huge store of pearls there and so that makes uh, Davis and Huish come up with this plan. They're either going to kidnap him or kill him and rob his uh, pearl establishment. <clears throat> but of course, he is absolutely, uh, uh, you know, impossible to um, uh, get around because he he knows exactly what these guys are up to. He befriends Herrick because he wants to make him an ally. 
<clears throat> and then uh, there's sort of a class element in that who uh, Atwater immediately recognizes that Herrick is one of his someone like him because he went to Oxford. So they they um, quote lines from Virgil's Aeneid to each other because Atwater uh, is a big fan of Virgil, of course. Um, Herrick is carrying around a copy of the Aeneid. Yeah, we That's haven't a, talked about that a lot. I want I want to just put a little footnote here so we can circle back around to it. The role of the Aeneid in this in this tale. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which there's a it's good, very it's very pronounced. At least there are many references to it. I don't know. If we can say more than that. Like what exactly it's doing. Yeah. Well, there's a good article on it, and the the, the person is arguing that the arrival at Atwater's domain is really a visit to the underworld. So, Atwater is really kind of an underworld figure, just like um, Aeneas goes to visit his father in the underworld and Kaisis to find out what his destiny is going to be, how he's going to make it to Italy. Uh, so he has to get this vital information, and he goes through these weird experiences in the underworld. So yeah, but Atwater, uh, yeah, there's sort of a weird, hellish environment uh, element to the um, to his domain. I mean, he has these guys working for him under absolute control, and he's, uh, when they have dinner together, he tells a story about how he... A servant of his apparently stole something and then ran away and then out of guilt hung himself. And uh, and then it turns out the guy wasn't the guilty one. There was another guy that Atwater found about and he 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 told him to uh, this other guy to go climb up there and cut the other guy down and he shot him uh, when he was uh, going there. So he's he's absolutely ruthless and yet he's a, a very um, uh, aggressive Christian missionary type who's hoping to convert all of them, and he ends up converting Davis. I and and I have to say, I have to say that this, I mean, this was probably the most compelling part of the book for me. <laughs> yeah, I I was kind of biting my nails when yeah. when I when I was at this point in the novella. I. I I, I mean, what I'll, I'll let I'll let you talk more about it, but I thought this was the best part of the of the text. Yeah, it's absolutely gripping. I mean, it's a it's a it's a completely um, unpredictable adventure uh, mm. at this point because you're not really sure what's going to happen. I mean, you know, Atwater is is very um, much aware these guys are after him, but then who is this guy? has the plan uh, that he's going to take this um, vitriol, you know, sulfuric acid, <clears throat> this bottle, he's going to throw it in his face when they get near. He's going to write a letter saying, I'm sorry, we, we, you know, we didn't really mean it. Can we please read this letter? When he gets close to him, he's going to throw this bottle in his face. Of course, Herrick, uh, I'm sorry, Herrick is, is already with that water because Herrick had, had, had decided he's going to commit suicide because he doesn't want to be part of this plan to attack Atwater. So he jumps overboard, and he thinks the the ocean is just going to take him out, uh, and he's going to drown. Well, the current pushes him into the shore, and so he washes up on Atwater's beach, and uh, joins Atwater there, and he's he's there near him when Huish and Davis arrive in their in their rowboat to try to pull off this uh, nefarious stunt, you know. And then uh, Atwater is very much ready for them. <laughs> and I won't say what happens, but um, the evil Huish is punished for his misdeeds, and Davis is miraculously saved. <clears throat> and he, at that point, he's converted to Christianity because uh, Atwater saves his life, spares his life when he could have killed him. And. Um, Atwater, you know, says you are forgiven. Go and go and sin no more. It's like well, this, I was going to say right, it's it's very much like the uh, adulterous woman parable. Yeah, yeah and, John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter nine, right? Um, the woman taken into adultery. Uh, so <laughs> it's a, it's it's a it's a magnificent twisting of it. Yeah, and I I think it's kind of interesting to think about the how. 
Atwater has set himself up as this sort of minister of God's judgment in a variety of different ways where, yeah. like you were saying it, it was really, uh, uh, slavish and hellish in the ways that he was running the pearl harvesting Island or whatever, but then at the same time, very merciful. Yeah. And in, in this instance where he was about to take the life of him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, his treatment of his native servants is, is terrible. I mean, one guy drops the bo- a young boy, drops a bottle of wine, and, and it looks like yeah, Atwater is going to strangle him. I mean, he's so angry at him. It's, uh, he, he is just terrible in his treatment of his employees. In fact, they are basically slaves. And there's a woman, a single woman on the island who survived the smallpox epidemic, and he, he married her off to a guy. She had she didn't want to marry this guy, but he insisted she marry this native guy on the island so that he wasn't tempted by, tempted by her. Um, so he's just an incredible autocrat, and he's acquiring this huge fortune in pearls um, so he can go back to England and live like a gentleman. Well, uh, is Stevenson trying to make a critique of Christianity via Atwater? Well, I think he's, I think he's just um, showing what can happen to you in, in that kind of situation. I mean, I was reading that this, his model for this guy might have been based on a Catholic priest named Laval in another Pacific island who was just working these poor, poor native people to death and thousands of them had died under his... Uh, his, uh, you know, uh, regime. Uh, so there, it's not really sure exactly who he might be modeled on, but there, there are examples, uh, local examples. And uh, one of the interesting things about the story is the influence it had on Conrad, because uh, <clears throat> the um, the whole story of uh, uh, the end of, of um, Heart of Darkness. Um, you know, involving this isolated European trader who has gone native and gone crazy uh, is partly attributable to his reading of, of the ebb tide, I think. Uh, there's definitely an influence there. Conrad read Stevenson and admired him and, and was influenced by him, very, very strongly influenced. <clears throat> they didn't know each other personally. But um, uh, the other thing about Atwater, too, is he, that, <clears throat> idea of the European on the island doing crazy things, getting away with murder, literally, also shows up in H.G. Wells's The Island of Dr. Moreau, mm. where Moreau is this scientist who's experimenting on um, <clears throat> dissecting animals and creating these sort of blendings of humans and animals together. Um, this, you know, this vivisection hell that he's running and um, uh, he's surrounded by sort of a jungle of mutant forms of life, and the and the narrator is kind of washed ashore on the island, and then has to figure out what's going on, and then has to escape from it. Um, definitely another um, sort of uh, literary descendant of of the ebb tide of the of the model of Atwater. That's fascinating. So do you, do you believe uh, justice was appropriately doled out? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Herrick, well, the only person who doesn't get their just desserts, of course, is Atwater. I mean, he's, he doesn't suffer anything. He gets his way. <laughs> he's not robbed. Um, Herrick burns the Farallone at the end, so there's no evidence of, of uh, their, their of the trace of their nefarious... Uh, 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 Arrival because the uh, Trinity Hall, the supply ship, is going to be, be coming in um, to um, uh, the harbor there. So Herrick, he's really the most honorable one, and he he survives, and um, he doesn't get converted. He, he, and he, I think he recognizes that Atwater is kind of a monster. Um, but Davis was kind of wavering on the line between criminality and, um, honoring, um, his, you know, going back to his family, uh, being able to support them somehow. And he is saved, but ironically, he's going to be staying on the island without water, even though he's got his wife and two kids are still back in, in New England. Um, 
So we do have a sense of, of justice except for this bizarre <clears throat> evangelical um, uh, Englishman, you know, who's running this, this little pearl fiefdom. <clears throat> Nothing's happening to him. Well, earlier we talked about uh, that uh, Atwater's uh, world could kind of be like the underworld from Virgil. Yeah. Uh, what might be some other mythic elements that are in the ebb tide? Uh, well, it, it, in the argument that this person is making, uh, it's that it's sort of the imperialist project of the Europeans in the 18th century of the French and the English who discovered Tahiti, say, all of them were, were uh, sort of um, thinking of these islands as sort of um, a rediscovered paradise, and they were on a, an empire-building mission for their native countries, right? And so England, both England and France tried to get control of Tahiti and, and the Marquesa Islands. And the analogy here is to Aeneas, who was on a mission to uh, found the civilization that later turns into the Roman Empire. You know, Aeneas uh, was created by Virgil. Virgil's writing in the in the first century, early first century uh, BC, under Augustus, uh, who commissioned him to write this story about Rome's foundings by this legendary character Aeneas. And so it's a kind of a justification of imperialism that Aeneas has to leave Troy. He has to leave Dido and Carthage, and then um, he has to go to the underworld. Um, with the Golden Bough, kind of lets him uh, into the um, into the privileged domain or the uh, dangerous domain of the underworld, and he has to get instructions from his father. He sees his mother. Um, so, what is happening in the ebb tide is Stevenson is kind of using this myth of imperialist. Um, discovery uh, by European powers to critique the destruction that has been brought about by these by these imperialist projects by England by France that were similar to Rome, you know, which dominated the Mediterranean world sometimes in very ruthless ways. So um, uh, there's not that close a mythic parallel. I mean, the, there are certain lines from the Aeneid quoted once in a while Herrick is is uh, carrying around a copy of the Aeneid um, but the key element is when um, uh, Atwater quotes a line about the, his island, his beautiful island where he is living uh, in Latin from the Aeneid and Herrick is able to cap Atwater's quote which gives him a magical pass into this domain by the fact that he can quote uh, from the appropriate passage in, in the Aeneid in Latin. Um, so it's kind of a subtext. I mean, Stevenson never went to university. He, he barely went to school. He had private tutors because of his illness. But he was, he had a standard foundation in Latin and uh, he definitely had read the Aeneid. Uh, which everyone would do if you were a, a certain educated gentleman in the 19th century. <clears throat> but I don't think it's, uh, it's not something that you see mirrored repeatedly. It's just an interesting parallel storyline. <clears throat> well, do we, I mean, we talked a fair good amount about the, um, the the imperialistic uh, overtones of the text. I mean, is there anything else yeah. you want to say about the, the post-colonial message of the ebb tide? Well, no. It just it forms part of a, some of Stevenson's writings when he was in Samoa because he wrote. Um, he, there was a dispute in the um, the chiefdom in Samoa. There, there was a appointed chief, and then there was a rival chief, and. Uh, Stevenson got very much involved in the politics of the the, uh, the local um, uh, interface between the Europeans and the, and the local Polynesian people. 
Um, so he definitely, I mean, he really kind of went out of his way to side with these peoples and he kind of went native. I mean, there's some great pictures of him lying around with a band of flowers around his head yeah. and his wife in a very loose gown, a muumuu. Uh, so people think of him kind of as a, a, a hippie of the 1890s. Um, he kind of went native. So it's not surprising. I mean, of course, the other great story about what's wrong with these European traders is the beach of Felisa. Um, I've got which, that. I've got that pulled up right now. I was like, "How did we go this entire conversation and not talk about it yet?" Yeah, uh, I read a, a dissertation that constantly compared these two texts. Why don't, why don't you say a little bit more about the Beach of Falsi- Falesia? Well, Falesa. Um, Falesa. Falesa. Yeah, it's a first-person story told by a guy named John Wilshire, who is an you know, Englishman who arrives on this beach to be become a trader, and he doesn't know anything about this area. But he's a rival to a guy named Case, who's a previously established English trader. <clears throat> and he marries a native woman when he gets there in a very quick ceremony. Um, and it turns out uh, that Case has tabooed um, Wilshire because he doesn't want his competition as a trader. So Wilshire, you know, has a damnedest time trying to figure out what's wrong, and he finally out, finds out that he's being tabooed by, by Case, and his wife uh, turns out to be really helpful, really sympathetic, someone he just, you know, decided to marry on the spot because he wanted someone to sleep with. Right. Uh, and his wife helps him figure out the situation, and then to get retaliation against this guy Case, who turns out to be much more nefarious than than he realizes at first, because he's kind of put the natives under a kind of a superstitious regime of terror with this devil worship um, process that he built a kind of a fake temple in the woods where it's almost like the Wizard of Oz where he's scaring them into doing his bidding um, by all these sort of sounds and um, um, weird little uh, uh, visual effects. So the story has a happy ending um, but it shows just, you know, how rotten some of these local traders can become because of their, their power, you know, over the natives and their, uh, and their kind of, um, moral degradation that takes place when they move away from their, from their, uh, native, you know, European habitats. So, yeah, that's fascinating. Well, we talked a little bit about how the ebb tide influenced uh, H.G. Wells, specifically with the the island of Dr. Monroe uh, and Conrad. Were, did we did we miss anybody else of his successors that he may have been influenced by the ebb tide? Uh, those are the main people. I mean, D.H. Lawrence. Oh yeah. Um, what, what's the D.H. Some... Lawrence? What's the Lawrence connection? Well, I think, you know, Lawrence Red Stevenson, the um, the image of the sort of autocratic proto-fascist <clears throat> leader is something that comes up in the novel Kangaroo, uh, not ah. that very well-known Lawrence novel um, about a, a political uh, leader. Um, and uh, so, no, I think H.G. Wells, Conrad... Uh, Henry James wrote a short story that kind of is based on some of the family saga of Stevenson and his wife's family. They, I mean, James tended to write these stories about the literary world in a in a sort of oblique manner about um, caretakers of famous writers and uh, shenanigans with with uh with their work and manuscripts and things like that so uh you know a little bit of henry james um uh jm barry of course was friends or an acquaintance really with stevenson um but yeah that that pretty much i think covers it for for that for that period i mean a lot of people were, were 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 reading him i mean he was he was really a very—he was a celebrity after he wrote uh, *Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde* in the mid 1880s. He was—he was, he was uh, constantly 
being interviewed and people wanted to, you know, um, uh, find out, you know, re read his work and find out more about his life and whatever. So he became a literary celebrity, and that's one of the reasons he went to the Pacific is to kind of to get away from that as much as he could. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Interesting. Well, I think we covered everything we wanted to cover. Is there anything you'd yeah. like to say in closing? Uh, no, I think we've, we've really uh, covered some of the major bases of the story, and everyone just jump right in, read that, and get get back into Stevenson. <laughs> well, Dr. Koo was a little bit more uh, coy about some of the details of the story. I probably would have spoiled it for people uh, had I been in the driver's seat. But uh, it's it's good reading. I highly recommend it. and. I hope you take the time to uh, enjoy it after listening to this conversation. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Cook, for enlightening us uh, okay. into, uh, in regards to this novel. And I guess we'll bring the show to a close and you and I will talk off air for a little bit and think about what we want to cover next. And if anyone has any suggestions, uh, I, I, I'm open to that. Uh, you can feel free to contact me at Philosophy Luke at gmail.com or just comment underneath this YouTube video and let me know if there's any requests out there for material you, you'd like to see on Noetic. So thank you okay. again, Dr. Cook. Okay. All right. Good.